Hey everybody, my name is Jared Dillon. Today we're talking about a little bit about messaging patterns in Ruby. Uh, as I said, my name is Jared. I work with Quick Left. I'm a software engineer there. <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter at Justice Fries. So we'll start off with welcoming you to the enterprise world. And that big blue dot money. is the money. It's enterprise. So when we look at this enterprise, we talk about a whole bunch of things, uh, things we typically don't want to necessarily interact with. And these things we interact with is actually a homogenous mass of many, many, many parts. Uh, who here has dealt with something like this, this huge, huge mass? Well, great, I'm sorry. Um, I have too, it's not, not, not the best thing in the world. But for the purpose of this talk, we are gonna treat it as a single mass. And we're gonna have a lot of things up here, so I decided to label them. Uh, I stole that from Jeff, so thanks, Jeff. Uh, so we, we want to integrate with this system. And for many, many whatever reasons, we can't integrate in directly with it. For political code, whatever reasons, we are actually operating outside of the sphere. And that little sphere is our application. Uh, if, here, let's just say it's a Rails application. And we're going to run with that. And what we want to do is actually start integrating with this system. So we start looking at, OK, what's the best way to integrate multiple systems here? Well, we can start off and say, oh, let's make an API between the two. We need some information. We need to consume something. So let's make a request out. So we make a request out. And we make another request out. Not so bad. We're OK. We make some more requests out. More. And you know, that's not the end of it. The, everything inside of there also will need to consume information from us. So we don't care about our requests. We now start to make endpoints. We have an endpoint. We have another one. Things are getting a little ugly. And we have some more endpoints that we all, we'll all want to work with here. Kind of an ugly mess. Who wants to deal with this? I sure as hell don't. And remember, we're dealing with a whole mass of different things in here. It's not just one big homogeneous mass. We're just abstracting it away. So we're actually dealing with this. Doesn't sound like fun at all. And we may have a public API we also want to deal with. So we're also facing the world. And now we have up here 17 things we need to manage and scale. And not only do we have to do that, our APIs, by definition, are very unreliable. And we have to get into the uh, into the habit of error checking all of these things and making sure that nothing fails. It's also synchronous. All these things that we do block either within the bigger system or on our Ruby app. So it's pretty obvious we need another way. So you might ask yourself, okay, what's that way? What can we do in order to fix this? And there's a couple things we can do to fix it. Uh, looking at our problems, right now we're synchronous. We're blocking our main application. We have a lot to maintain and scale and play around with. So what if we started talking about an intermediary broker here? Something that would deal with all these interactions for us and let us consume at a rate that we want to, effectively making us asynchronous in nature. And we can do that. And these things communicate with each other. And we do that with something called a message queue. And for the purposes of this talk, we're going to talk about RabbitMQ and RabbitMQ is a messaging queue built out of the AMQP standard developed by J.P. Morgan Chase in 2005 to solve this very need, to solve the need of integrating lots and lots of systems with lots of different code bases in an asynchronous way. And we can do this. And it's battle-tested and battle-worn, and we know it works pretty well now. And it's all built in Erlang, and it's extensible through Erlang. So assuming we've done this, we now only care about our Rails app and our messaging server. We don't care about the wild world beyond. We can interact with whatever we want past that. And that was a weird magic move. Uh, so these things only talk to each other now, the Rails server and the messaging server. And we do this through the notion of queuing information up. We can start to let things work together, queue all this up, and actually start to somehow process it. But we need to process it. And our Ruby server, or in, and we go from this convoluted, nasty mess to something more like this. And much like the enterprise, we haven't told the whole story yet. 
The bigger story we're telling here is not only now do we have our, our Ruby server, we have something else. We have our web server. And now we're letting our web server doing what it's good at, serving requests, handling our business logic, and generally being a Rails app. But we've added something else into the mix. We've added workers. Uh, and workers are little processes that can spin up and really do whatever we want. And we, we, what we're doing here is actually yanking things out of this queue and doing something with it. Does it matter what it is? No. And here's the most trivial example of that. This is some code running in an event machine loop with the Ruby AMQP gem. And I have all the resources available at, this, at the end of this talk if you want to go check it out. But the Ruby AMQP gem runs on top of event machine. And who here is familiar with event machine? <laughs> For those of you who aren't, uh, AM, the event machine gem is a fairly sophisticated gem that embodies the reactor pattern and enables some concurrency through event registration. So that's what we're doing with the Ruby AMQP gem here. And all we need to do is subscribe to the channel we want, which in this case will be some transactions. And we have a direct exchange to that transactions queue from our application that it subscribes to. We receive a message, we put it out, we're good to go. It's about as simple as you can get for a worker. But of course, you can integrate this more into your application. And now we're looking at actually scaling horizontally. And OK, what do I mean by scaling horizontally? Well. We have three workers. They work three messages. OK. Well, what happens when these three workers start to get overwhelmed? We're, past, we're processing too many messages from this side to really handle it. And we start to see bottlenecks. We can add five, six, 10 workers. We can keep spinning up processes in order to take the load off of our application. And so we're looking at scaling in a very, very interesting way in that Everything happens asynchronously, and you have to think in a little bit of an asynchronous environment because nothing happen is happening directly or having a direct effect on the application. So we solved a problem. We've added this messaging queue in between this large homogenous system that we don't care about and our Ruby application, our Rails application. And remember, our application, since we now have multiple processes running in there. And we start to see the same problem yeah, the, the, within our applications. This thing keeps growing. We start to see some bottlenecks that are not only in the not only in our app, but we start to see intra-app bottlenecks. So typically, the way you would solve that, of course, is go back, look at your bottlenecks, and start to solve them. And that's a great thing to do. But this asynchronous pattern we've just talked about in our app, and it's a fairly common pattern, we can actually apply into our application. I, I'm going to pose the question, what if we made our controller actions asynchronous? What if, what if when we're generating data, we don't actually provide a response at that point, but we pass it off to something else to handle that and actually add the data into our database and do really the work for us, and once again, we're letting the web application do what it's good at. And we're creating other things to let them do what they're good at. So we don't care about this anymore for the rest of this talk. We just care about the Rails application. So once again, we're not telling the whole story here. We have our Rails application. We have some workers in there. They're doing their thing. Everything's going happy. Everything's working. But we also have a database server. And this database server is handling our requests and doing things that it needs to do and generally interacting with our application. And of course, you can see a performance bottleneck here. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But it, it scales dependent on our application. So here's a, what a controller might look like. I abstract it a lot. It's basically pseudocode. But you know, we, we create a new object in memory, and we check if it saves. If it saves, we will do something. Probably redirect to an index page if you're going off scaffolding or whatever. If not, render out. But the key here to think about is this is a blocking operation. This will wait until the request to the database server is made, is finished, and is complete before 
we continue with the life cycle of the application. And if you're, if you're seeing these bottlenecks and you're in a position where you have these problems, they, that, that can be a pretty huge bottleneck where milliseconds can matter. So we're starting to talk about some sort of worker again. Okay? And we have multiple options. We're not going to use AMQP for interapp or intra-app communication just because we have a bunch of options in the Ruby world. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, who's heard of delayed job? Who likes delayed job? Great. Um, so, so the first thing we can talk about is delayed job. And on the plus side, it's very simple. This dot delay dot method. It enqueues it into a uh, into a database table, adds a row, has a, has some locking mechanisms built into delayed job. But you have a problem, right? Because you're still dependent on your database's performance. You're not adding a new piece to component here. Well, you are with workers. You're adding new processes. But you're not adding any new servers to run. And this could be great. For the purpose of this, though, we're saying that our database is already constrained. We're working under real life constraints. And so adding delayed job and processing tons and tons and tons of jobs when we make everything asynchronous might not be an acceptable option. OK. So who's used or heard of Q Classic? Very few. Yeah, Wayne's heard of it. OK, great. So Q Classic is this awesome thing made by Ryan Smith of Heroku. And what it does is it actually uses features in Postgres SQL, uh, a published subscription model that is in there, to actually act as a queue. And act as a queue without being fully burdened by all the things required in a relational database. So this is pretty awesome. It's new. It works pretty well. But we're still talking about database constraints. And it'll still add some sort of constraint on our server. So we'll leave that as, out as an option for now. And kind of go back to the drawing board with that. Uh, the last option we can talk about is actually one of my favorites. Who here has used Rescue? Cool. OK, so Rescue is a, is a queue system built on top of the key value store Redis. I hope everyone here has used Redis. There, anyone here who does not know what Redis is? OK, so Redis is a very fast, lightweight key value store that has uh, some set, set algebra capabilities. And so you can do some pretty powerful things with it, including building an entire worker queue system on top of it. You can also use it as a memcache replacement, and it's good at that. My, huh? Yes, and it will persist to disk. That is the difference between Redis, and, big difference between Redis and memcached. So, OK. So we're talking about adding another piece to our system. As I just mentioned, this is a very easy to set up extra piece to our system. So of course, we have to think about these trade-offs. You know, and, and that's really what we do, right? We're making a whole bunch of conscious decisions driven by the trade-offs we have to make. And in this case, maybe adding a Redis server is an acceptable trade-off. It's fairly low cost as far as complexity. and Eat pretty quick to get running. So we're looking at a example of a model that has an asynchronous create that we can start to enqueue things into and we can start to run jobs on top of. Uh, up in our transaction, we specify the queue we want and we have a self.perform method that the worker will actually run and do what we want it to do. And in our model, I've added a, an async create method. I'm missing the self. It should be def self .async create, But other than that, I mean, we're in pretty good shape here. So all of a sudden, our controller looks like this now. We're creating our, our object in memory, but we're not actually saving it. We make sure it's a valid object, and so we know that it passes all of our tests, all of our validations, and it's something safe we can do, do something with. And now we pass it off to Redis. We say async create. And we now will enqueue that. And it'll be worked at a later time. This requires a pretty major shift in the way you think about applications. The reason I say that is because you're not doing anything here 
except for rendering a successful response. And I left out that piece of that code because that doesn't matter. But you do not do any data manipulation within your app server itself. You're passing it off onto something else. Now, if you're obviously if you're requesting data, this may not be the model to choose. But for creation of data, if they don't need it immediately, you can start to look at something like this. And you can also start to look at tools such as real-time services, WebSockets, or other interval polling and other methods in order to start to get this data out. You can, get, you can have the data pushed to the page where we're ready. And this is a pretty fundamental shift in the way we think of web applications and offers a new way to scale. The reason I say that is because now, of course, as our application starts to get loaded, we can fire up more and more workers to work on the rescue queues. And we've shifted the, the problem. We've shifted the problem in the user's favor, in that when a user's operating with the application, they're not bound by everything we're doing in the background, but they are now operating on what they can see and what they can work with. And when you're ready for them to work with new pieces of information, you'll give it to them. So we've done something major here. We've taken a very synchronous system. We've taken a system that was a problem that we were looking at, that it was just the blue and the red, the, our enterprise massive scale area, and our, our Rails Ruby app. And we've done two things. We've abstracted the problem of synchron synchronity and blocking away from our inner app communications, away from our APIs that communicate outside of the context of public APIs. And public APIs are a whole different matter, but the ones between the two, the two systems we've now alleviated. And we've enabled a new way of scaling. We've also done the same thing within our application. We've considered you know, delayed job, we've considered things that may hurt, harm our database, but we've instead gone with a worker system that adds a little bit of complexity, but overall helps our application in a lot of ways. And more, more, more all, we've made a fundamental shift in the way we think about web applications. You know, this model, I'll, I'll hammer it again, is not a synchronous model. You cannot host out with this model, create something, and get it back immediately. It'll be available when the workers have processed it, but you're trading availability for a lot more speed and a lot more of a distributed system. So I've left some time for questions. Uh, my name is Jared Dillon. I'm at Justice Fries, like Freedom Fries, but better. And there's some resources here. These are all resources we've discussed in this talk, gone over briefly, but, and these are all great gems. But more or all, focus on the architecture decisions we've made here and how it benefits your app. Thanks so much. Questions? Mike. You still have that constraint, yes. Yes, and, and I deliberately avoided that because de database concerns are a... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so Mike's question was, so we, we've abstracted everything out and made it so, so everything's asynchronous. Well, how do you deal with database issues that you, you're still blocked by the database, and how do you deal with that? Is that yeah. Yeah. Right, you, you have more people trying to put information into the database all at once. Uh, and my response to that, of course, you know, I, I left that, that out of this talk deliberately. Database scaling is a huge, huge I mean, topic that a lot of people have thought much more deeply about I have. Of course, you can, once you have that constraint, you're starting to talk about finding ways in order to, to scale that database, and, and that really becomes a bottleneck at that point. Beyond asynchronity. That, that, yes, that's a very good point. Uh, 
the follow-up was, if I ask if something's valid, if I create an object in memory and check if it's valid now, when I queue it, and if I do a deploy something else, I change validation rules while it's sitting in the queue, or however long that may be, that could cause problems later down the road when it attempts to create and fail validation. And so, of course, when you're building the worker, you would have to build in error checks against that. Uh, you may want to check if it's valid, again, or actually be able to kick it into a failure queue to be able to be handled and, and send off the proper notification, send an email, you know, this order failed, here's why, to the user. And so that, at that point, you have to really decide how you want to interact with the people using the system. That's a great question. So the question was, if since because I'm just checking if something's valid and you're queuing it, do you run the risk of losing something if if the queuing server or Redis were to crash? In the case of Redis, you can make it persistent and write out to disk, and so you're protected. You still have those objects in the queue ready to go. In the case of RapidMQ, you can also make your queues become persistent, and so they'll write out to disk and reconstruct. When they are when they're restarted, the downside of that with RapidMQ is it's much slower than than when it's just operating in memory. And so if it's it really comes down to what you're doing. If you're doing something critical like a transaction I just showed there, absolutely you'd want to use a persistent queue. If you're processing analytics data, okay, you miss a you miss a point here and there. You probably don't care so much. You probably care more about getting the bulk data that you can aggregate over. So the question was, what if your queuing server is down when the, when the job is pushed in the first place? In, I mean, in that case, the, the flat out answer, nothing happens. They can't make the connection, they can't put the job in there. That, that gets a lot more into developer operations as far as what you do on the server side. If, if you can't do it at that point, you, you do have to have some exception handling around that and say, you know, kick it back, you can't do it. or Another option is to, of course, have synchronous fallbacks. And I ne wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but you can. The new version of RabbitMQ has active active AJ. As what? Active active AJ. The new version of RabbitMQ. Oh, the new version does? Yeah. OK. Uh, Josh was saying the uh, new version of RabbitMQ has active AJ, which? Active active, so both two masters. Okay, yeah, so you can have, so before with RabbitMQ, you, you had much of a, a master-slave setup, and so now you can have two masters as well to help insulate you against that. You know, you're, you are talking about, one of the trade-offs we did, um, we do have to think about is now we're trading for a single point of failure, and how do you insulate against that? So it's about insulating against failure at that point. So I prefer Ruby and QP. Oh yeah, yeah. So the question was, do I prefer uh, Bunny and, or which which AMQP gems do I prefer and why? I prefer Ruby and QP first because the I like the DSL around it and it does run asynchronously in the vent machine. Bunny and Carrot are great. They are your they are synchronous options, and so if you need to do things in your controller. In, in Rails itself, with the queues, you can use those. I prefer Carrot. I like the DSL better. But Bunny and Carrot are both good gems, in my opinion. Any other questions? How do you handle having a whole bunch of moving parts in your system now that you've started to make it more complicated? 
And how do you make it easy to develop in that environment? Am I? OK. So the way I've done it is when, when setting up these systems, of course, you, know, you have to make the hard decision, OK, do I want to add this moving part to the system? And the one way I might do it, and I've done it once with mixed success, is set up uh, a chef solo script in order to get everybody set up and running with the same environment. And then using gems like Foreman to do process management and run all my things all at once have really helped that process. It can be a nightmare when you have to say, OK, you have to boot up 10 processes to really develop on this thing. That can get ugly. But if you want a great gem to start looking at that and start alleviating that problem, Foreman is an excellent process manager that by declaring a proc file and saying Foreman start, it'll start everything in your application all at once together and keep it running and maintain a single log to see what's going on. And Mike. Oh, okay. So Mike was saying there is a great gem with Chef Solo called Soloist, and Pivotal actually uses it to set up their workstation. So I'll check that out. Be sure to check that out as well if you do this. Thank you so much. Thank you.